Hi and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to talk about again AMD AM5 uh, Direct Die because around like end of December, starting of January, we started to launch and also sell our like Direct Die tools, the delivers Direct Die frames, and then we received like a huge amount of feedback, especially regarding AIO mounting on CPUs. Because even though you might have like a very good contact if you just looked at the imprint of the thermal paste or like the liquid metal on your AIO versus the dice, it looked nice, but the performance was often not there. The reason for that is quite simple, that the AIO cold plate is simply not made for at the same time spreading the heat and also dissipating this huge amount of heat. Because usually, I mean, you're mounting an AIO on top of a heat spreader, which already spread the heat and then you're just dissipating or like removing the heat with the AIO. And so I started like end of January, I started working on a high performance heat spreader. And once I was done with this, like once we had finished working products, I was like, so the only thing missing is like cutting some microfins into it and we would basically have a water cooler and that's how it started. And now we have our own AM5 direct dye water cooling block ready. And it's like currently in production, we have a few samples which are like already done. So we are like mid in the mass production phase, but I want to show you today already what we did and what kind of performance you can expect from these products. The general problem is mainly that the IHS is a little bit thick and at the same time, we have the hotspot sitting somewhere here on the bottom. So the like majority up here is pretty much useless. And at the same time, the main area, like the centerpiece is quite small, also compared to let's say AM4. Usually when you would approach this kind of problem, same as what we did in the past with like Intel upgrade heat spreaders, for example, usually you would just keep the like outer shape maybe the same to make sure it's still compatible with like the ILM or the SAM from AMD. And then just make sure that you maybe increase the surface area a little bit and well, keep the SAM. So that would mean that usually because you have the SAM and you have these two areas where it's putting pressure towards the CPU and like the, just the outer shape would basically stay the same and you're still limited in height because you cannot go lower than this part of the SAM itself. That's why I first came up with this design. So that's a 7600X, but it's a dual CCD, which mattered most for like the design. So I made these two plastic I call them like base materials. And then this is basically a huge heat spreader. So you can see it has like higher surface quality in the center. And then we have these like pillars, you could probably call them things that push the CPU into the socket. And then, I mean, those plastic things are mounted on the back plate. And then we have four threads in there. And then this way we can mount the heat spreader on top and push the CPU downwards. Now the thing is, this is only two millimeter high which I did on purpose because you want to keep it a little bit shorter so you can like earlier dissipate the heat so the delta is smaller because we just keep it thinner than the stock IHS. But at the same time, it's losing mechanical stability because it's rather thin. And yeah, so if you have a high mounting pressure, even though this is two millimeter thick, it starts to bend slightly, which is actually not that bad because it will just mean that if you mount an AIO, for example, you will have a very good contact mainly in the center of this IHS because it's slightly bent. But at the same time, the issue is you have your chips underneath that are like 100% straight. And if you have your IHS on top like this, it will generate hot spots like on the edges of, of the CCDs and of the IO die, which I mean, it was better than the stock AMD IHS, but yeah, not perfect. That's why we came up with this design. And we also had our learnings from like Intel contact frames, because you can see the outer shape is basically the same and also the height. So it's six millimeter high, which also means that this will have a huge amount of stability compared to the previous two millimeter high heat spreader. And on the bottom, we have the same kind of shape that allows to press the CPU into the socket. And in the center, we have a diamond milled, like very low roughness surface for contact. We have some insulator sheet on here to make sure it's like not making any kind of like electrical contact with the board. And then it's just mounted on the CPU like that and because it's so thick, you can even use like insane mounting pressure and it will just not bend at all. 
especially the surface that makes contact with the dice, it's very important that it's not only flat, but also that the roughness is very low. I mean, the higher your roughness is, the like more thermal paste you would need. It's a typical misconception that some people think that if a surface is rough, that's increasing the amount of surface and it will help to dissipate the heat, which is like completely not true because in a theory, if you would have a perfectly flat surface on the copper and also perfectly flat on the silicon, for example, you wouldn't even need thermal paste because it would just make perfect contact between two materials. So the surface roughness is definitely important. And we have a roughness tester here and I want to show you something. Even though that's a, like a German comparison piece, but I can just simply explain it. So you basically have two parameters that are important for the surface roughness. We call it RA and RZ which are measured in a micrometer and for example for like horizontal milling it just ends at RA 0.4 and 2.5 so it's basically the roughness in micrometers measured. So the way this roughness tester works is that you have a very tiny needle here in front and basically you're just pulling the needle across the surface and then you can read out what kind of roughness this needle had while going over the surface and then you can read out the RZ and RA values. As comparison, we're just measuring this Rocket Cool IHS, which I bought quite a while ago. I never used it, so the surface is pretty much unused. And the way it works, you just put it on here, put the needle on the surface, press start, then the needle is getting dragged across the surface, and then it's giving you the surface roughness. And obviously, the surface roughness also depends on like the direction where it was milled. Now we have RZ of 1.28, which is actually quite good. But also, it's, it's like um, a good, normal finish I would call it and as I said before it depends also on the direction the mill was going across the surface that's why we're just measuring again in 90 degree difference and here it's a little bit more it's like 1.7 so I would say on average it's maybe like RZ is 1.5 and as you can probably see this is like a mirror finish which is achieved by diamond cutting the surface so now we're just measuring the diamond milled heat spreader And with RC 0.28, it's at least, I would say, five, six, seven times less rough than the Rocket Cool IHS. We can also do the same, like 90 degree angle test here again to check. And I mean, it's even flatter, it's uh, 0.19. The surface roughness is one thing to measure the quality. But then again, it's also very important how even the surface is. And you cannot check this with this kind of test because it's just taking the data from a very short distance. In this case, it's five millimeters, but it will never tell you how even the surface is. And there's a very simple test to also check this because if you have two extremely flat pieces and you put them together, you will not be able to take them apart again. As you can see, there's like nothing on there, no glue or anything. I'm actually not sure if it's with copper the same, it works with steel. You basically call it cold welding. So if you push two steel pieces together that are like extremely flat, the same thing will happen that they stick to each other. And if you wait for long enough, uh, you will not be able to take them apart again. I mean, here it's with a little bit of like force, it's doable, but I also never waited more than like 10 seconds. And based on all of that, with our high performance heat spreader, I started development of our AM5 direct dye water cooler. We'll just go back to my YouTube studio and then do some testing and show you some performance data. First, we will mount this 7900X with our upgrade heat spreader. So first of all, we're removing the AMD SAM, CPU into the socket, then of course, liquid metal, which is uh, Conduct Not Extreme, and now doing the same on the high performance heat spreader. Then you will mount the entire IHS over these four screws. Just hand tighten them in a cross pattern. Just 
until it's like making contact with the board. Basically not really possible to over tighten because it ends up firmly with the PCB itself. And when it's hand tight, you know, perfect. Then you know that you're good to go. And now because the mounting height is almost identical to stock, it's like about a millimeter deeper, you can basically mount any cooler on it. It might be that some air cooler is not compatible because it's like limited too much in height or if you use some kind of monoblock, like a water monoblock, you might have to adjust the thermal pad height for the inductors and for the VRM maybe. But apart from that, it's very convenient. I tested everything on the Aros Master B650E that you just saw and also obviously because I first had to test like everything stock I did all of that prior to what you've already seen with the 7900X running a manual overclock at 5.0 GHz at 1.30 volt core voltage. And I was using a 280mm AIO by ASUS for the stock comparison and what you can basically see are two runs of Cinebench R20. The blue line is showing the stock condition with the 7900X in the first run achieving about 87 to 90 degrees Celsius and during the second run usually most of the time 90 degrees Celsius. Now mounting the same 280mm AIO with the same torque and with the same thermal paste on the AM5 high performance heat spreader that is sitting on the deleted CPU we can see a drastic reduction in temperature. That's also the yellow line. And due to the like massive increase in surface area, the CPU is now running about 12 to 14 degree colder than prior to that. One way to optimize this even further is using the offset mounting kit and then using the UNC to M3 adapter. The only thing though is I had to modify the mounting kit of the AIO. I had to cut a piece because you're moving it quite a bit towards south. As you can see, otherwise it would just collide with the heatsink on the bottom. The offset mounting kit is lowering the temperature even further. We can see with the gray line about 4 degrees Celsius lower temperature and that's also pretty much in line with what we saw on Ryzen 5000 when we also already did some offset mounting. And here we have the Micro Direct Die RGB. And as you can see there is no logo or anything on there simply because I wanted to keep it as clean as possible so I decided to not use any like Thermal Grizzly logo or the Bauer logo or like Micro because that's the product name Micro and yeah just wanted to keep it very clean. We have this acrylic ring that you can see around that's like shining to the side and then also same thing on the fittings because this acrylic part is slightly bigger than the fittings. Makes it look quite cool I think because you can always see this shiny ring from the side on your fittings and also depending on what kind of fittings are you using, what kind of tubing. If you go for hard tubing I saw that if you use like hard tubing with white fluid then it will just shine through which also makes it look quite cool. Since it's very similar to the high performance heat spreader, it's also mounted exactly the same, except for that you mount it through the four holes that also go through the acrylic. And then, I mean, that's basically the block. It also has two magnets on there, which are used to attach the anodized aluminum top that also includes the RGB strip. And this way you can also rotate it by 180 degree if you want to have the cable exiting from the bottom. We will also have a cheaper version of the cooler without RGB that's just using a black POM top. And now I will need some of your feedback regarding the visuals or like the design. So we can have this like rather clean one or we can have that one that's more like a stripe optic which is just using like a smaller mill, smaller end mill going back and forth. Whereas here we're just using a bigger end mill just going all the way over it. And yeah, maybe just the clean or the striped version. Let me know which one you think looks better. As a reference for comparison, I was running the Corsair XC7 Pro, again with Conductor Not Extremes. I'm just using the same TIM out of the same tube. And this is shown in the blue dotted line. And the CPU is here showing a temperature of about 66 degrees Celsius under load. Now with the Thermal Grizzly Micro Direct Eye RGB and again Conductor Not Extreme, we achieve about 62 to 63 degrees Celsius. And that is the green line all the way on the bottom. Now compared to the stock condition, with the 280 AIO, I mean this is about 25 to 28 degrees Celsius lower and that's certainly giving you a lot more headroom to do any kind of overclocking. Since we're just talking about new stuff anyway, I also want to show you CryoSheet, which is a graphene pad 
And I mean, there have been graphite pads around for a long time, like IC graphite and also the, the carbon out stuff that we already have. But this is graphene that's optimized in C direction. So, I mean, any kind of other pads you have are optimized for X and Y thermal transfer. And this one is optimized for C transfer. So it's actually like 90 degree rotated, which leads to so much better performance. It will obviously not be able to beat liquid metal because it's just, it's 0.2 millimeter thick and that's always going to be a limit. But I just still want to show you the results. Cryo sheet, which is the red line, in combination with the micro direct eye water cooler will perform with about a 68 to 69 degrees Celsius. I mean, that's about five degrees Celsius worse than the liquid metal. But then again, I mean, this is not going to become a worse over time. So it's not going to age which will make it a lot easier when it comes to any kind of maintenance or like anything, any hassle that might occur in combination with liquid metal. Over the previous weeks and months, I also tested a lot of different designs, different kind of structures, especially because it's a bit different when you do a direct eye than just a normal water block. So for example, the distance you have on here on the contact surface to like the bottom of the cut of the fin is, I mean, for a nowadays water block, maybe 0 0.4, 0 0.5 millimeter, you want to keep it extremely thin for quick dissipation of heat. Whereas for direct dye cooling, you also need a bit of mass to also spread away the heat from the chips. So it's a bit different here and also played around with like different channel sizes and fin density, whatever. So for example, this one, like very fine fins with a 0 0.3 millimeter cut and 0 0.25 fin size and like much bigger one and then tested with different pump speeds for example. Overall this was the best with very high pump speed but whenever you use like a D5 and you like lower the, the volume to maybe 25% flow rate then this will be much worse than for example this one. So yeah, had something in between all of these three. Just wanted to show like what kind of prototypes we were making in between. And also, I mean, this is how the liquid metal looks like after a few applications. And obviously that's why we went for chemical nickel, nickel plating for the production one. I think that this version of cooling with cryo sheet and not using liquid metal, even though it will result in like worse temperatures by about five degrees Celsius, is still a very good decision to, to go for. Because, I mean, if you look at this and you just assemble your system once and then you might run it for, I don't know, like two years and not having to worry about liquid metal forming some kind of alloys or whatever and might have to reapply it after a certain amount of time, even though it's nickel plated, there is still a possibility that something goes wrong with liquid metal, which you don't have using these graphene sheets. I think that could actually be a quite interesting thing for the future and... That's why I wanted to like present all these kind of different things to you. And also that's something, I mean, that's stuff I'm doing besides YouTube or I have been doing for the previous weeks and months. And that's why I thought it might be interesting to just show all these kind of different creations to you. Also, in case you might worry about Intel, I finished the same block design for Intel as well. It's currently in still the validation phase. I still have to tweak a little bit some things about the block but then should be available quite soon. We're finishing production, like mass production in about three weeks. We're still working on like the copper parts and the acrylic parts right now. Like they're literally just manufactured right now. And pricing wise, we are expecting about 100 euro for the pump version and about 130 to 140 euro for the RGB cooler version. The upgrade heat spreader is expected to cost about 40 to 50 euro roughly. It will also depend on your location after shipping and everything. All right, thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye bye.